our uh, speaker is Bryony Sands, and Bryony just moved here to Vermont last September. Was it September, Bryony? Feels like, or was it October? It was supposed to be September. Then it became October. <laughs> and right at the end of September. Yeah, um, all the way from England, and Bryony is working with us. She's a postdoctoral research fellow, both with UVM Extension and the Gund Institute here at UVM. And she is studying the interactions between cattle pests and parasite management and subsequent impacts on soil ecology. Um, building off from her research, her PhD research in the UK. So she's going to talk to us today about her research in, in the UK, which has focused on the role of insect decomposer communities in suppressing livestock parasites on pasture and the impact of parasit parasiticides, there we go, that's a mouthful, on these processes. So she's going to be talking to us about IPM, IPM with our livestock which is really exciting. And so Bryony, I am gonna turn it over to you. Um, yes, like Heather said, I've just moved from the UK um, from the University of Bristol. Um, I did my master's in veterinary entomology um, and then my PhD in livestock agroecology um, in relation to beneficial insect decomposers. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about sustainable dung ecology. Um, and I grew up in the east of England. Um, it was a very rural area, um, but I'm not from a farming background. So both of my parents were teachers. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sort of telling you a bit about my research, um, but also hearing your thoughts and ideas um, surrounding this area too. Um, so first of all, I'm going to take a bit of a dive into the dung ecosystem with you um, and then talk a bit about the ecosystem services that dung invertebrates provide us. Um, then I'll move on to talking about what happens and why um, decomposition might fail. Um, and then finally, talk about integrated parasite management. Um, as a tool to maintaining a well-functioning dung ecosystem um, while also effectively controlling for pests and parasites. Um, so firstly, as you will all be very well aware, um, manure is a highly valuable resource. Um, it's full of nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, um, the three major plant nutrients as well as a whole host of other nutrients um, and minerals. Um, it's also a key source of soil organic matter. Um, so in agricultural ecosystems, soil organic matter is the main contributor to soil fertility, um, soil structure, and it's also the largest carbon reservoir of the terrestrial carbon cycle. Um, finally, manure supports a complex ecological succession of invertebrates and microorganisms, so it's a really biodiverse habitat. Um, and we'll just take a bit of a look at what um, all, all sorts of invertebrates that you can find um, in a cow pat. So, First of all, we've got our nuisance um, insects. So um, the pest flies, things like face fly, horn fly um, breed in the dung. And then we've got the parasitic nematodes. So they are the gut parasites and internal parasites of cattle, um, which have part of their life cycle out on the pasture um, in the dung as well. Uh, but it's not all bad news. So we've got um, a load of beneficial insects as well. Um, so we have coprophagus beetles and flies, and that means that they um, eat dung, they live and breed in the dung. They're really important for the dung decomposition process. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, then we've got predatory insects, so predatory beetles and fly larvae, 
And they actually prey on the nuisance um, fly larvae um, and they suppress pests and parasite populations within the dung. So they have a really important role. And then finally, we've got our ecosystem engineers here. So you'll all be well aware of how important earthworms are um, for soil structure. Um, and then we've got dung beetles as well, which are also really, really important for a number of ecological processes. Um, and all of these insects and invertebrates here um, have a role in supporting other organisms higher up the food web. Um, for example, often declining species of farmland, uh, mammals and birds. Um, so I'll just take a closer look at some of these really quite beautiful um, beneficial insects that you can find in dung. Um, so these ones are our friends. They are the predatory beetles and flies. Um, so in the middle here, we've got the adult of the yellow dung fly. Um, they're very, very common flies. Um, they're very quickly colonize fresh dung. Um, so the adults will eat other insects. And then we've got this, the noon fly, um, the flesh fly. So the adults of these don't um, eat other insects, but their larvae do in the dung. So they have carnivorous larvae, um, maggots, which live in the dung and they eat the pest fly maggots um, and suppress the pest populations. Um, then under here, we've got some predatory beetles. So these are not actually um, dung beetles. Uh, the adults of these do eat dung, but again, the larvae are carnivorous. Um, the larvae um, go around in the dung um, and eat the maggots of the pests um, again. So these ones here are actually um, hydrophilids, so they have evolved from water beetles um, and they have evolved to live in dung, um, and then that one's a hyster beetle. Um, so moving on to the coprophagous beetles and flies, um, on the right here, we've got the black soldier fly. Um, you might have heard about how important the black soldier fly larvae are in the decomposition process. Um, so they will consume and process vast quantities of dung very quickly. So they're really, really important for um, decomposition and pasture nutrient cycling. Um, and then over here, we've got the true dung beetles. So they live, eat and breed in the dung. Both the adults and the larvae consume and process the dung. Um, and they are my personal favourite of the dung invertebrates. So I'll talk a little bit more about the dung beetles. Um, so this is what you might picture when I start talking about dung beetles, um, the large ball rolling species that you often see um, on nature documentaries in um, the African savanna. Um, however, dung beetles are actually found on every continent in the world um, except Antarctica. But this is sort of more like the species that you're likely to find here um, and in temperate climates as well. So this is Aphodius fossa, a very common dung beetle species that you would get here. And there are actually about 90 species of dung beetle in North America, um, but they are in decline globally. And we'll talk a bit about why that might be uh, later on. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about dung beetles um, is that there are a few different groups of dung beetles based on um, their habits, basically. And the two groups that I would like you to try and remember for this talk is um, tunnelers. So they are also called dung burying beetles or paracoprid beetles. Um, and they enter the dung pat um, and then they make tunnels underneath the dung in the soil below and they drag the dung down into the soil and lay their eggs in the dung that they've buried. Um, the other group is the dung dwellers or the endocoprids. And they actually just live in the dung pat itself. They don't go um, underneath the soil to dig tunnels, so they stay on the surface. Um, oops, sorry. That, so this is just an example of the um, 
tunnela or the burying beetles that you might find. They're often sort of rounder and more convex. Um, and then this is a dung dwelling beetle. Um, they're usually more elongate and pill shaped. Um, and the distinction between these groups is important if you think about um, the ecological functioning. So the tunneling or the burying beetles um, are said to have a more important ecological role because they're bringing that dung right back down into the soil um, quickly, which has a really important role in that nutrient cycling process. So I'm going to mention these two groups later on in the tour um, in relation to some of my research. So if you could just try and keep those in your mind. Um, the final group of invertebrates that I wanted to tell you about um, is these phoretic mites. So if you turn a dung beetle over, you're likely to see on the underside um, lots of these tiny little predatory mites. And they hitch a ride between dung pats um, on the dung beetles. So you might think that they are sort of using the dung beetles as a taxi service, um, which they are. Um, but the dung beetles don't actually um, get caused harm by this. Um, and they actually do benefit from it as well. So these mites are predatory and they also feed on pest fly larvae and on parasitic nematodes within the dung pat. Um, and those pests and parasites would actually be competing with the dung beetles for the food resource of the dung. So they're benefiting the dung beetles and they're also benefiting us by providing, again, the ecosystem service of uh, pest and parasite suppression. So now I'm gonna focus a bit more on the actual ecosystem services um, provided by these invertebrates. So, this is sort of um, the process of decomposition. You can see on the left here, this pat has been heavily colonized by dung beetles. It's got lots and lots of um, holes in there where the dung beetles have entered the dung. Um, and then you can see it's been fragmented, dried out, broken down, um, and it will have completely disappeared from the pasture within um, a few weeks in the summer with good dung beetle populations. Um, in places like Africa, it can be as quick as a couple of days. Um, so obviously that has got a really important role in dung decomposition, removing the dung very quickly from the surface of the pasture, which is essential for nutrient cycling, bringing those nutrients that we talked about back down into the soil, which is important for pasture fertility. Um, as I've mentioned quite a few times, the pest um, and parasite control and providing um, food for other um, farmland species. Um, the other thing is um, the role in soil structure. So um, the tunneling action of the beetles um, has been found to improve the hydrological properties of the soil, helping with water infiltration. Um, and more recent research looking at greenhouse gas emissions. Um, obviously, if you've got the dung um, being quickly removed from the pasture surface, again, that's going to help reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, so overall, the, these ecosystem services have been valued at um, $380 million per year in the US. Um, there have actually been two attempts at putting a value on these ecosystem services. Um, the first one was much older and it came out as two billion a year. Um, I've gone with this one, just to be conservative, um, which was, um, that was done in 2006. Um, and it was based on um, the percentage by which dung insects um, increase dung removal, reducing pests and parasites. Um, nutrient cycling, etc. So I'd like to focus on the ecosystem surface, um, service of parasite suppression um, and just talk a bit about some of my research. Um, so I wanted to find out whether the action of dung beetles in the dung could reduce the transmission of the free living stages of cattle um, intestinal parasites on pastures. 
Um, and this work was done in the UK. So I'll just recap the transmission, the life cycle of um, cattle gastrointestinal parasites. So the adult worms are found in the gut of the animal. They lay their eggs, um, which are passed out in the dung onto the pasture. So the eggs hatch in the dung on the pasture and develop into the first and second stage parasite larvae. And then the, it's the third stage of the parasite larvae, which then begin migrating from the dung out onto the pasture. So they're moving away from the dung um, out onto the grass. And they're called the infective third stage larvae. And it's that stage um, that the cattle will then eat when they're eating the pasture, um, consuming those larvae and reinfecting themselves. Um, the larvae will then develop into adults in the gut of the animal um, and the life cycle continues. Um, so common, um, a, a common strategies for uh, disrupting this transmission process is uh, treatment um, of the host. So um, these are your common treatments like ivermectin, um, and that's targeting the life cycle of the parasite within the cow. Um, so what I was interested in is whether you could target this life cycle out on the pasture um, with these beneficial insects. So this was a uh, quite large field study. Um, we collected 400 kilograms of naturally infected cattle dung. So this dung had about 100 eggs per gram of the common um, cattle gut parasites, cuperia and ostatagia. Um, so we then made 260 artificial dung pats out on a pasture. Um, you can see you can see where the arrows are, is um, just the dung pats there. And we had three treatment groups for this. So we wanted to have dung pats that had no dung beetle colonization. So we had um, the wire mesh cages um, pinned over those dung pats to stop insects coming in. Then we had naturally um, colonized dung pats. So they were just left open to the air for insects to colonize. And then we had enhanced levels of colonization where we collected dung beetles and added extra ones in. Um, so after about two weeks, the eggs, um, the parasite eggs in that dung will have begun to hatch and the, those larvae will have started migrating out onto the surrounding grass. So after two weeks, we started cutting the grass around the dung pats. And then we did that every two weeks for a period of 10 weeks. Um, to extract the infective um, third stage larvae from the grass. And the majority of these infective larvae are expected to be within around um, 15 centimeters of the dung. So looking at the results, um, this is quite a busy graph. So I will try and take you through it um, one step at a time. Uh, so up the side here, we've got the number of infective um, intestinal parasite worms that we found on the grass. Along the bottom, we've got the experimental week. So that was over the 10 weeks of the experiment. And then the different colored bars represent the different treatment groups. So the white bars had no dung beetles, the light gray had naturally colonized pats, and the dark gray had extra dung beetles added to them. Um, so you can see at week two, this is not really what we were expecting. Um, so here, the pats that had um, more dung beetles added actually had a higher number of parasite larvae on the surrounding grass. So at the beginning, more beetles meant more parasites. Then in weeks four to six, there was no difference here in the number of parasite larvae on the grass um, around pats that had beetles or not. However, when we got to week eight and onwards um, for the rest of the experiment, you can see here that the white bars, the ones that had no dung beetles, had many more parasite larvae um, collected from the grass around them. Um, so we can see that from week eight onwards, the beetles reduced the number of parasite larvae that were found on the pastures. 
Um, so obviously this is a complex relationship. Um, we can explain these processes. So um, the parasite eggs in the dung need oxygen in order to start hatching. And so we think that at the beginning of the experiment, those wet dung pats, um, when the dung beetles came in and colonized them um, and started moving that dung around, it would have increased the oxygenation of the dung, allowing more parasites to hatch. Um, however, over the, um, over the whole grazing season, the action of those dung beetles in um, uh, fragmenting it, drying it out, breaking the dung down, um, would actually reduce the number of infective parasite larvae overall. So the conclusions from this are that over the summer grazing season, um, dung beetles reduced the number of infective parasite larvae on pastures, and we found that it was by 20 to 30 percent. Uh, so that shows quite a good potential um, of healthy dung beetle populations to con contributing towards parasite management um, on pastures. However, we also found um, when there were high rainfall events, um, there were loads of parasites on the grass, um, irrespective of dung beetle numbers. So that just goes to show the importance um, of environmental factors like weather um, in parasite transmission and it also in treatment decisions. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to talk a bit about what happens when decomposition fails. So um, we know that parasites are a major livestock health and production challenge. Um, clinical disease is usually avoided by using um, these various veterinary treatments. Um, so this is just a delta methrin based spot on um, for things like face fly. Um, and then we have the classic um, ivermectin, so that's normally used for internal parasites, but it does work against external parasites as well. Um, so these chemicals can be really great at controlling parasites, um, but it is now clear that there are some major issues um, with the common treatment strategies. So the first of these issues is the development of resistance. Um, so regular treatment of, of whole herds does apply strong selection pressure um, for parasites to evolve resistance to the treatment chemicals. Um, so that will be a familiar process to you. Um, you know, we see antibiotic resistant bacteria and when we're applying um, that strong selection pressure, um, organisms do evolve to evade particular treatments. Um, and it, this has been historically a bigger issue in sheep, um, but we are seeing resistance in cattle parasites um, in the US as well. There have been reports of pyrethroid resistant flies, um, as well as ivermectin and moxidectin resistant gut worms. So the second issue um, is these environmental impacts. Um, so many of these chemicals are broadly insecticidal um, by design, which they're very good at. So they are made to be toxic to invertebrates against pests and parasites, um, and they work at that. The problem being is that after um, the cow has been treated, they are still insecticidal when they come out the other side. Um, so now you've got this dung, which essentially contains insecticides, um, and that is going to have off target um, toxic effects on those beneficial pasture insects that we learned about. Um, and it's known that for a lot of these chemicals, 90% of the dose can be excreted um, largely unchanged in that dung. Um, and research has shown us that with a sterile dung pat that contains none of these beneficial invertebrates, um, that dung can still be on the pasture an entire year later and has not started decomposing. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, a, a second piece of my research now. Um, so we've known that since, uh, we've known since the 1980s that these chemicals do kill dung insects um, at the pat level. 
but I was interested in whether that um, actually leads to dung beetle population decline on a landscape scale. So um, yeah, do those um, toxic effects that we see um, actually scale up to reductions in dung beetle biodiversity um, in the landscape? So I did a pitfall trap uh, survey of dung beetles on 24 beef farms across southwest England. Um, and we included farms that didn't use any parasiticides, um, farms that use synthetic pyrethroids, so things like deltamethrin only, um, and then farms that use the macrocytic lactones, so ivermectin, aprinomectin um, only. And we did these pitfall trap surveys, so that involved making these artificial dung pats, um, laying them on a wire mesh that was covering um, a buried bucket underneath. And the idea there is that the dung beetles will fly in, they'll be attracted to the dung and colonize it, and then they'll fall through into the bucket below. Um, and then we can collect them and identify them. So we identified over 42,000 dung beetles from this study. Um, and we actually found no differences in dung beetle abundance between the different farms. So the farms using macrocytic lactones, synthetic pyrethroids, or no parasiticides had similar um, num overall numbers of dung beetles on their farms. The interesting finding that um, we did see was that species diversity was 63% lower um, on the farms that used the macrocytic lactones. Um, so that is important um, if you think back to what I was saying earlier about the different types of dung beetles and how they have different um, ecological functions, whether they might be burying a lot of dung or whether they're just staying on the surface. Um, so an example here, sort of a visual explanation of species diversity. Um, we've got four different types of dung beetle there. Um, so there's four different species, so that's high diversity. Um, if we had four beetles, so that's the same abundance, but they were all the same beetle um, species, that is low diversity. Um, so we can see that communities might start to be dominated by a few more resilient species. Um, so you're losing the diversity, um, but maintaining the abundance. And this is probably the most important um, finding from this research. Um, again, we're thinking about those functional groups. So the dung dwelling beetles versus the dung burying beetles. Um, so this graph shows the abundance. So the overall number of dung beetles that we found um, up the side. And then along the bottom, we've got the farms that used no insecticides, the farms that use synthetic pyrethroids, all the farms that used macrocytic lactones. Um, and then the dark gray bars uh, represent the dung burying beetles and the light gray, um, sorry, the white bars represent the dung dwelling beetles. So we can see for the farms that didn't use any parasiticides, there's a roughly um, equal split here, 60 to 40 ratios of dung dwelling versus dung burying beetles. However, when we got to the farms that use synthetic pyrethroids, you can see that the dung burying beetles here are starting to reduce in number. And now we've got 80 to 20. So the dung dwelling beetles are starting to dominate those uh, communities. When we looked at the farms that use macrocytic lactones, you can see the entire population here is pretty much dominated by dung dwelling beetles. And those clearly more sensitive um, dung burying beetles have pretty much completely disappeared. Um, so the dung burying beetles appear to be more sensitive to parasiticides, um, which is bad news because they are also the ones, as you will remember, that have a higher ecological function in quickly burying the dung, bringing those nutrients back down into the soil and contributing towards those ecosystem services. 
um, that we were talking about. So the conclusion um, from this is that there are negative impacts on dung beetle biodiversity at the landscape scale, um, particularly for the macrocystic lactones, but um, synthetic pyrethroids also seem to have an impact on the ratios of the beneficial dung burying beetles. So here we've got a sort of negative feedback loop. So more treatments against the parasites, um, as we've seen, results in fewer dung beetles on the pastures. That actually results in more pests and parasites because of the um, dung insects role in naturally suppressing them. Um, and then obviously we're gonna have to use more treatments um, and so it goes on. The other element of this is that more treatments also um, lead to more resistance which results in more pests and parasites being left on the pastures again. Um, so it's important that we try and break out of this. Um, and that is where integrated parasite management comes in. So um, in the final section of this talk, um, I'm gonna take a look at um, integrated parasite management for cattle and how it might provide the tools to combat um, some of these issues that we've talked about. So this is um, sort of common practice. This is UK based, so you'll have to um, correct me at the end if it's different here. Um, so usually this is um, calendar based routine treatments. Um, uh, across the grazing season, so at turnout um, and perhaps regularly across the grazing season, you'd have your macrocytic lactones like ivermectin um, against internal parasites. Um, you might have delta methrin for face flies during the grazing season. Um, you might have another another macrocystic lactone treatment for fluke towards the towards the autumn, um, and then during housing in the winter we have obviously problems with things like lice, and that might need another pyrethroid um, treatment. So um, this is obviously simple and easy. Um, it's based on a regular routine approach. Um, it could be seen as being low cost. So I think for a, about 150 cow dairy um, in the UK, the wormer spend probably comes out around um, just over a thousand dollars. The other thing is that it, it might be perceived as the safest thing to do. Um, so you might think if one cow um, is very wormy, or maybe a couple of cows appear to have a high worm burden, um, it would be common sense that the rest of the animals would have a worm problem too. Um, however, we know that that is not actually true. So parasites do have an aggregated distribution within host populations. So what that means um, is that about 80% of the parasites will be found in just around 20% of the animals. So you might have some very wormy animals, um, the other ones might be fine. Um, and that can be for a variety of reasons, usually um, to do with the animal's immune system or other issues going on. Um, so you might actually be able to get treating all of the cows. Um, the other thing is that these treatments have historically been effective, um, but as we've seen, that efficacy has a time limit if we're applying strong selection pressure um, and resistance develops. So yeah, looking at the costs of this uh, routine treatment, like I said, um, resistance in parasites can lead to drug failure. Um, also, there's no chance for the cattle to develop natural immunity. So cattle do get um, immunity to worms, I think, against things like cuperia, that can be quite quick in a grazing season. Um, Ostatagia, I think, probably needs uh, about two grazing seasons. Um, but 
time in contact with the worms is important for the animals to create this natural immunity. Um, so they need to be in contact with low levels in order to um, build up that immunity for life. Um, so if they're being uh, treated um, consistently and they're never in contact with any worms, um, they're not going to get that natural immunity. So potentially you might have to keep treating them um, for much longer in their life. Um, and then there could be wasted money involved in um, unnecessary treatments. The other element, as we talked about, is the environmental uh, toxicity. So these huge environmental impacts um, on the dung invertebrates and then that negative feedback with the loss of ecological functioning with, um, from the natural parasite suppression that these beneficial insects provide. Um, so looking at solutions um, in terms of integrated parasite management, uh, we can use vaccination as sort of a safety blanket. Um, I think a lot of, I think this is still in development. So um, they are developing vaccines for things like gut worms. Um, we have a uh, lung worm vaccine in the UK. I don't know if that's... Um, I don't know if that's authorised here yet, but hopefully it could be in the pipeline. Um, and then just monitoring what is actually going on um, using diagnostic techniques like faecal egg counting, um, other things like milk um, antibody testing to see um, if the animals actually have parasites um, and how severe infections are. Um, and then we're going to be using treatments only when we need to, um, based on that evidence. So targeted selective treatments only when necessary um, to the animals, um, the only the animals that actually need it. Um, we can also choose less harmful products. Um, there is um, a sort of a scale of environmental harm. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so things like doramectin and ivermectin are thought to be the worst. Um, and then we come up here to moxidectin and insect growth regulators, which are fairly benign. Um, and it's also important to rotate these products. Um, obviously that will help to stop resistance developing um, and it'll also uh, be better for um, reducing those toxic environmental impacts. Um, this is just something that I sort of put together when I was trying to help somebody else work this out. Um, but it's just an example of how we might look at the environmental um, toxicity of some of these different products. Um, so I've ranked them by toxicity, um, persistence in the environment, whether they accumulate in the environment, um, how mobile they might be. Um, and we can see here things like the macrocytic lactones are um, of high environmental concern, uh, synthetic pyrethroids medium, um, and then things like clisantel, um, low environmental concern. And these are usually the more specific ones. So they are specifically flucicidal. Um, the macrocytic lactones are very broadly insecticidal. So as I mentioned before, um, they are good at killing all sorts of invertebrates um, and that is not a good thing necessarily. Um, I haven't got fenbendazole on here, but I know that has been used um, in this area. Um, and again, that is quite a low environmental toxicity product. So that could be a good choice. Um, so looking at strategies for determining the presence and severity of infection, uh, basically, do I need to treat my animals? Um, obviously, that's easy with things like lice and flies because you can just see them. Um, but it's obviously more challenging um, with internal parasites. Um, but again, we have our faecal egg counting. Um, other indicators like body condition, weight and scours. Um, so this is a farmer called Bruce, who is a friend of mine from the UK. 
Um, and he actually invested in a microscope himself. So he does his own fecal egg counts now. I think that's in his kitchen. So that is a bit questionable in terms of hygiene, but um, they're fairly straightforward to do. So you could, you can learn how to do them or you can, um, you can just talk to your vet about it. And there's lots of places that do that. Um, there's other tests. Uh, milk antibody tests. So sometimes if the parasites are um, sort of um, in stasis, they can be in the gut lining of the animal. Um, and then there's no eggs coming out in the dung, but the animal still has them. They're sort of hidden. And you can pick up on that using things like serology and antibody tests, which look at whether the animal is mounting an immune response to them. Um, and we can think about things like treatment thresholds. So it might be acceptable to you to have low levels of um, parasitism that don't cause any clinical problems. Um, usually a treatment threshold for cattle might be if, if you get above 200 eggs per gram, um, we might think about treating. Um, and then there's other alternative strategies, um, thinking about things like sword height. So the parasites will only be present in the um, lower, the bottom couple of inches um, of the pasture. So not grazing down too low can help to stop the cattle coming in contact with them. Um, there's things like high tannin forages, um, uh, things like chicory. So Tannins have been shown to help naturally reduce parasites in cattle as well. Um, and then again, building up the animal's immune systems. Um, so this is sort of a mapping system that um, a farmer has developed. Um, and that was so that he could um, sort of make sure that he was putting his young stock, which are obviously the most vulnerable, um, on the lowest parasite burden pastures. Um, he was moving them regularly as well, using electric fencing and a movable water trough, um, so that they were co constantly getting fresh pasture that had very low levels of parasites on, um, but they still were in contact with them, um, low enough to not cause any clinical problems, but ensuring that they would build up that natural immunity quickly. Um, then we have things like mixed or sequential grazing. So um, a lot of these parasites are very host specific. So cattle gut worm might not be able to um, survive in sheep. So that's where mixed um, or sequential grazing can be really useful. Um, if, you're, if you've grazed cattle and then you bring um, sheep in behind them and a sheep takes a bite of that pasture that's got cattle gut parasites on it, it's going to be a dead end host. So the, the, the parasites won't survive. So that's a good way of breaking the transmission cycles. Um, and then we've got the biological control again, um, making sure we've got healthy numbers of um, these beneficial insects that help to naturally suppress the pests and parasites. Um, thinking about external parasites and um, alternative strategies for control. Um, so insects breathe uh, with spiracles, little holes on their exoskeleton. Um, and that's where mechanical toxicity can come in with things like oils, which block the spiracles um, and essentially cause the insects to suffocate. Um, so things like mineral oils can do that. Um, this is a picture of a farmer applying a mixture of Stockholm tar and eucalyptus oil um, against uh, pest flies. Um, and he's had quite good results with that. Um, the other thing is essential oils. So essential oils are plant secondary metabolites. Um, so they're basically produced by plants to deter insects herbivory. So to stop insects eating their leaves. Um, and that means that they are insecticidal by nature. Um, I've done some work uh, treating donkeys for lice using 5% solution of tea tree oil. Um, and that was 95% effective in a field trial. Um, so that's quite, um, I mean, that could be adequate in suppressing lice to below a problematic level. Um, I'm not suggesting 
that anyone would have the time or inclination to spray essential oils on their cows. <laughs> um, but you can get creative with things like this. So I was talking to someone last week who was um, buying a um, cattle self-groomer, um, like a scratcher with a mineral oil dispenser. Um, and then you could put essential oils in there. So essentially the cows would be rubbing it into themselves. Then we've got traps for things like pest flies. Um, there are a whole host of different types of traps out there, um, just sticky ones or ones with a, a attractive um, things that are attractive to the flies. You can have walk through ones. Um, and then again, thinking about natural enemies. So this is a parasitoid wasp. Um, and these are these uh, breed in dung and you find them anyway on the pastures. Um, so they will actually lay their egg into the pupae of a pest fly, um, a pest fly pupae. So then the wasp larvae will just consume the pest fly larvae and out of this will emerge a wasp instead of a fly. Um, so that's quite a cool um, evolutionary process. And you can actually buy these, they call them fly parasites. Um, you can buy these parasitoid wasps and release them um, in housing, etc. So um, that's about it. Um, I just wanted to finish by um, just saying um, you know, in the world today, we do have multiple pressures um, from climate change, from biodiversity loss of these beneficial insects, pest and parasite resistance, um, economic challenges as well. And I think it's important to sort of try and foster resilience um, and moving away from the one size fits all kind of mindset um, so that, you know, we can draw from um, like a whole toolkit of strategies that are specific to the farm, specific to the situation, specific to the weather. Um, and that will ultimately result in more resilient um, ecosystems with better outcomes for the livestock um, as well as for the environment. So that is everything. Um, I did just want to say I'm doing a survey um, of Vermont dairy farms. Um, I'm hoping to find out about patterns of pest and parasite management, um, learning about your experiences with pests and parasites, um, how effective your present strategies are, um, and also what the priorities might be for the future. So, this is a bit of a shameless plug. Um, if, you, if you receive one of these, it would be awesome if you could complete it. Um, yeah, and that's it, thank you. Hey, thanks, Bryony. That was really fascinating. And I love the last picture. I've never seen a rhino <laughs> beetle, like almost real, <laughs> almost in person. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was a great presentation. I know I, I learned a lot and um, want to encourage everybody to, um, you can put your questions in the chat. I, it's also a small enough group. I'm uh, happy to let people unmute and, and ask their question as well. So Carol was asking if these beetles are attracted also to sheep and goat dung. Yes, yeah, they are. So um, there will be slightly different species um, compositions with different types of dung, um, but a lot of the species are um, generalists as well. So yeah, the short answer is, yeah, they're, they're really important for all sorts of um, mammalian dung, um, domesticated animals as well as wild animals. Um, and I see that Guy had a couple of comments Guy, any anything you want to pipe in with? Well, I just think it was a great, great program. Um, really, I think um, the last few slides are kind of where we're at with with uh, you know we work with organic farmers and um, the holistic approach basically is what you were saying with the, all the different ways of looking at it. Um, and you know, just as far as the um, synthetic dewormers go. 
the two that are allowed by U.S. US uh, organic program are fenbendazole, which you mentioned had a low toxicity, and the other would be the moxidectin. Ivermectin used to be allowed. It is no longer allowed, and we are pretty happy about that because of the environmental, you know, detrimental effects. Yeah, I mean, those two are fenbendazole and moxidectin are both lower environmental toxicity. So, um, yeah, that's encouraging. The one important thing for organic dairy uh, and beef or, or you know even other uh, meat animals when you use the synthetic uh, treatment in an organic situation it's emergency use only it's a fallback when all, everything else has failed um, the problem is it the animal is no longer eligible for organic slaughter for meat purposes so it you really wouldn't probably use it too much in the beef side on the dairy side we do use it um, in in limited cases, but then it needs to be recorded in with the with the certifier that that animal is no longer eligible for organic slaughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I just want to. Um, I'm sure people can see this on your screen, but if you are looking for uh, certified crop advisor credits, we do have one available today in the pest management category, and you can um, scan the QR code and get that credit automatically. Um, I see Sarah Ziegler, you had a question. Do you wanna unmute and ask? Sure, I was just kind of curious about that. You mentioned like the fly predators, the parasitic um, wasp larvae you can buy. And I was just curious if those are all like generalists or if they are more specific in the particular parasites hosts that they'll lay their eggs in? Um, there's a few different species. Um, I think they are fairly generalist, but I'm not entirely sure. So yeah, I'd have to, um, you can, you, I mean, you can buy them commercially. So they will, they'll have information on, um, yeah, which species are targeting which pests. Um, there's what, there's definitely ones for stable fly um, specifically, but. Thanks. Great. Uh, Carol, I see you have your hand up. I'm not sure. Yeah. If can your you mic hear me? Is working. Yep. I did. Yes, can you can. Hear. Great. Uh, I know this is organic, the focus, but uh, with the small ruminants, non organic, uh, it's now being recommended that <clears throat> when you get a new animal, new animals in, or if they're infected, you blast them with like three different types of parasiticides. So, that being the case in the conventional world, um, and perhaps if an animal needs to be treated in the organic world, um, is the best thing then to leave them into in the barn for a while, so that yeah. they're not manuring on the fields. Is that it? Might be beyond the scope of this, but I thought I would ask. No, it's a good question. Um, yeah, it would be better to leave them in the barn um, because then that dung's obviously not getting out into the ecosystem. Um, the, the other thing is um, some research that I just did last year um, was interested in seeing how quickly these chemicals degrade. Um, so for example, if you're treating your animals and leaving them in the barn and then storing that manure and then spreading it, um, does it still have toxic effects or have the chemicals degraded? Um, and we found that after four months of storage, um, that this was with ivermectin, um, we found that after four months of storage, there were still um, toxic effects on terrestrial invertebrates and also the runoff um, was potentially toxic to aquatic invertebrates as well. Um, the caveat with that is that the chem these chemicals are known to degrade um, quite quickly in sunlight, and this manure was stored over the winter, so um, the re it, it would depend on the season, but um, that's just something to think about. It is better to keep them off the pastures when you're treating them, but um, it doesn't, if you're storing the manure, it doesn't necessarily mean that the chemicals are going to have disappeared. Yeah, that was one of my questions, Bryony, that um, I know we had talked about just, and Carol, our, this work that Bryony's doing is, is for all, um, or the survey is going out to all the dairy farms, regardless of organic or conventional. Um, but I'm curious if the pesticides 
can survive in the like liquid manure pits, mm -hmm. if we have any information on that. Yeah, that, so there really hasn't been much research into this at all. Um, and that's sort of this, this study that I did was only, we only stored it in a field heap for four months. Um, and so there's loads more questions to be answered about um, whether things like slurry in the tanks would degrade um, quicker um, and other things that, I mean, there's a whole host of things that could affect how quickly it degrades. But yeah, there's not much known about that at the moment. Um, any any other questions or comments? Oh, Aunt Drew, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good. So yeah, this was really fantastic. And I have animals, both cattle and sheep, but I often work with um, 4-H and young people who are showing animals and they buy an animal and, you know, sometimes the price they pay and so forth. I mean, the animal isn't in the best condition. So um, yeah, the ivermectin products, when they have a calf that's not doing well, usually does wonders for that animal. And I was really fascinated and I was going to ask the time frame question. And I really would like to know, I mean, maybe that's some further research or something. I mean, you said after four months in a manure pile, it's still viable, but even for my own, you know, use would a year do it, would two years do it, or, you know, I mean, what in composting might yield that? And then the other question I had was, and again, kind of thinking like if I'm talking to 4-H kids and, and I want them to have good looking animals because I judge those animals at the fairs, and it really makes a difference. I mean, if you have a wormy sheep or a wormy cow with rough hair and a bottle jaw, and I mean, they just, they look terrible on display. Um, so obviously not organic, but in the animal itself, as the animal is shedding the feces, how long are they shedding the drug? So for example, if I deworm my cattle once in the pasture season, are they shedding for a week or are they shedding for three months? I'm guessing not three months, but you know, I think that makes a difference because if 95% of my patties in the field are not contaminated, then it's not like I'm destroying the, the entire environment. Yeah, I mean, um, so it does depend on the route of administration. Um, obviously something like a bolus, which is releasing for a long time, that would be the worst in terms of the length. Um, okay. Injections are um, released for a bit longer. Um, I think they can be, they can still come out in the dung up to like 30 days, but there's a, there is a, a, a drop off. Um, with, um, with porons, you see um, a very high amount being released in the dung over about a week and then it drops off quickly, whereas the injection um, is sort of sustained for a little bit longer, but it doesn't get to such a high level. Um, so there's quite a lot of differences in um, which administration route you're using. That's um, really helpful. No, I mean, it's, it's just something I've never really, I, I have heard about the ivermectin's effect on the invertebrates, but you know, this yeah. idea of what you know, type of route might least contaminate the environment. I think, you know, for those of us that are conventional farmers or, you know, advising people, um, this, this was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Carol put in the chat a uh, project that was done through SARE looking at residual um, parasitide in compost. Do you have anything, Carol, on that Qu a quick, <laughs> quick results? Um, they were using doramectin and um, the piles that were turned versus unturned manure piles, they called them compost. Um, the temperature got hotter in, the, hotter in the turned ones and it decreased the amount of doramectin, but they couldn't make a comment on the, um, you know, whether it was a low enough level not to affect the environment. That's all. But they'll give you some measurements in there. That's really interesting. Thank you. Just got it up now. Any other um, questions or comments, additions to the conversation today for Bryony or anyone else? We did um, try to lot for more time this year, just so we didn't have to cut the discussion off <laughs> right after an hour. Um, but we're also not going to stay on forever if people are you know, Heather, um, this is Guy. Just <laughs> yeah. a couple of things I want to reinforce that were really important. Um, 
one is the grazing management, you know, and, and, and especially in an organic system to not overgraze because the larvae are, are very sensitive to drying. And so they're in the, in the morning, they're in the dew, they're up on the, on the vegetation. And as they, you know, as the day gets hotter, they go closer to the ground. So if we don't graze that bottom four or five inches, we really, you know, cut back on the parasite burden. And, you know, a couple of the alternative strategies that were mentioned in passing that are really important are uh, the um, tannins in the plants. That's, that's one that's really important. And there was a research in New Zealand, a guy named Neetson that did work on sheep which demonstrated two things. Uh, he, he was working with a, a plant called Sulla um, and uh, it, the tannin level was quite high in there. And it, the interesting thing was, uh, and I think you hit on this a little bit, is you don't have to kill every worm uh, because in that study in the, in the lambs, uh, they, were, they only decreased the population, the, the tannins in the plant only cut down the worm level in the lambs by 50%. It didn't kill every last worm. And yet there was an 80% response rate where the ones treated with ivermectin, uh, drenched with ivermectin weekly, uh, only gained 20% more weight per day than the ones uh, that were just getting the tannins uh, from grazing. And so we don't have to kill every last worm. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's this whole thing about being holistic and, and looking at all the different parts is so important. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, having sort of multiple angles of attack, um, they don't all have to be like 99% effective. And yeah, there's can be an acceptable level of, of worms. Great. Well, Bryony is going to be here at least for two years <laughs> working, working along this lines. And she's kind of kicking, kicking off her work by, you, you know, administering this survey to kind of understand the, the landscape. And um, we're hoping to gear up and do some field research this summer as well, and hopefully um, continue to build on the great information that she already has from her past work too.